Hey everyone, my name is Diana Garcia. I'm a licensed mental health counselor in Florida, owner of a private practice called Nurturing Minds Counseling. Okay, we're gonna continue our monthly book therapy series. So as you can see, I'm gonna switch over to some slides now on the screen. So the monthly book therapy series, it's just a summary on a book that I decide to pick out that I recommend, I encourage you to read it, but if you don't read it, my goal with these videos is that at least to give you three key insights that you can take away. Okay, so let's jump in. So this is what we'll be going over. I've tried to actually condense things a little bit for this month, uh, honestly, just to make it a little bit more digestible. So let's see how that goes. <laughs> okay, so to start off, this month's pick is The Happiness Trap. So The Happiness Trap is by Russ Harris, uh, How to Stop Struggling and Start Living a Guide to Act. This book was published in 2018. It's about 246 pages. Uh, honestly, I picked this book because this is one of my go-to books that I recommend to clients. And it's just, it's a great kind of introduction to acceptance and commitment therapy. I think Russ Harris does a really good job of summarizing the concepts, making it easy and digestible, understandable, and just, he has a ton of tools in here. And it just goes hand in hand with a lot of the work that I do. So it's just uh, easier for clients to integrate the work if they're reading this on their own. Okay, so to summarize, um, The Happiness Trap, like I said, uh, the reason I picked it is because it is kind of an acceptance and commitment therapy and book. Uh, that's one of the therapies that I really gravitate towards. And so in the book, he starts off by going through when he refers to what is the happiness trap? So common myths and kind of reasons why we struggle and we get stuck in this narrative uh, when we start to suffer, that we shouldn't be suffering, and all the reasons why our society, biology, kind of perpetuates this myth and different reasons why. Then he does a really good kind of job of going through and explaining the different uh, concepts of acceptance and commitment therapy and then like lots of kind of chapters on specific strategies for each um, kind of different process that he goes through. At the end he really spends some time focusing on values because that's one of the biggest components of ACT. It's really kind of using your values to help guide you move forward. And then again he goes through some questions, um, some activities that you can do on your own. And that's the thing throughout the entire book that's kind of the style there's tools and activities that you can do and he heavily encourages you to apply it because just like with therapy we always talk about you know that one hour 45 whatever minutes you're in session is great but really the goal is to make sure you're applying these tools and skills outside of the session in your everyday life okay so my top three key insights from this book so number one <laughs> It's this myth that you should be able to control what you think and feel. So that's one of the four myths that he goes through that kind of leads to this happiness trap and why we really struggle. But really this myth is all about, there's this kind of perception that you should be able to control what you think and feel like 100%. And if you're not doing that, that must mean you're doing something wrong or something's wrong with you. Um, and even to a certain degree, a lot of kind of different therapies kind of subscribe to this model. So this is definitely a shift a lot when I tell clients this perspective uh, that you don't have full control over your thoughts and feelings. Really what you have control over is your actions. So what you do with your hands and feet, as well as how you respond to your thoughts and feelings. But I always use the example that, you know, if you have an uncomfortable thought or feeling, it's not like you can just kind of turn it off like you were gonna turn off a light switch, right? If it were that easy, <laughs> right? There'd be no need for me or you know, other mental health professionals. So the reality is this myth really challenges that, that you don't have that much level of control because when we buy into this myth and then we're still struggling and we do all these things to control our thoughts and feelings and especially the uncomfortable ones and they don't go away, we start to feel really bad about it. And again, we're doing something really wrong. So this is just that first myth that I think uh, very concretely I'd encourage you to take away. And again, there's like three or four other myths that he goes through and then he further kind of talks about this illusion of control. So I'm gonna leave it at that because I really want you guys to pick up this book. The second kind of tidbit that I picked out, and again, there's so many to pick out, but at the one that kind of, as I was going through the book again, um, it's just this perspective that the mind is a great storyteller. 
So it's really to help and start to recognize one, that you are not your mind, right? Your mind has thoughts, uh, but you are not your thoughts. And our mind is a storyteller that's constant, constantly generating stories, evaluations, judgments, uh, assessments about things. And some of these assessments and stories can be helpful, but sometimes they're not, right? So it's kind of like recognizing that your mind is this great storyteller, but it's constantly kind of spitting out all these stories but you eventually can learn how to figure out whether you want to buy into that story, right? If that story is helping you in some shape, uh, some form that it's helpful to you. The other piece too, you know, I think there's a stat in here that he talks about that 80% of our thoughts typically have some type of negative connotation. Um, and I think that we can go back and recognize too, that's part of the way our mind works to keep us safe, right? Because if you're constantly assessing our environment to make sure there's no danger uh, to keep us alive. So either way, it's just kind of recognizing once we recognize that our mind is this great storyteller, we can also start recognizing some of these stories that come up for us, especially like can, common themes that show up, right? Because I'm sure most of, us, most of us have certain stories that kind of just keep coming back up. Um, and then it's kind of recognizing one cool tool is kind of naming that story. So if this was a chapter in a book, what would that uh, chapter be called? So for instance, uh, let's say there's a story of not feeling good enough, right? So maybe that's the uh, never enough chapter. So when that story shows up, it's like, oh, there's that never enough story showing up again, but do I want to listen to it? Okay, so that's just kind of this mind is a great storyteller. I wanted to highlight that. And then there's a bunch of other tools to help you realize when you're getting caught up by your thoughts and how you can really start to shift that response. Okay, and then the last one, um, it's this quote that I wanted to just point out, um, but it's really all about values. So values provides a powerful antidote, a way to give your life purpose, meaning, and passion. So it's not a specific tool, but it's more so this insight that values can really, again, like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, Values can really be our North Star when we start to get lost or overwhelmed or we're struggling with our pain. Uh, we can always kind of drop into our values and help us figure out like what is a value-based decision, right? So again, there's a whole bunch of tools or questions you can ask yourself and he even provides a lot of those in the book, but I just more wanted to highlight this piece that a lot of times doing values work can really help clarify things and I'm not saying that it's like, oh, now you know a value and now it's very easy and clear what your path should be. Not at all. There, you know, maybe you know a value, but something's getting in the way. And values can still be that kind of source of motivation that can help you keep going or be clear on what is really important in this situation for you or in this moment in your life. So again, I just wanted to highlight that that values can be a tool and something that you can really start to explore on your own, right? There's, again, he has tools in here and worksheets that you can use, but you can just really start to dig deep and kind of what are the things that I want my life to stand for, right? What are the things that are really meaningful? And not only maybe kind of aspirational values, but more like, okay, how does that actually show up if I practice it? All right, and then lastly, who can benefit from this book? Honestly, I'm super biased. <laughs> But this is a book that I really recommend to a good portion of my clients just because there's so many concrete tools. And I think a lot of times people really like those tools and the way he explains the concepts of ACT just make it really easy and digestible. Although I always tell clients when they're reading this book, yet yeah, there's some concepts that might feel really kind of out there and like contrary to everything you know. Uh, and that's okay, right? So maybe if you don't initially buy into it, that's fine. But I think this is a great primer for you to start kind of exploring these different ideas or thoughts. All right, so that's it for today. I just want to thank you for kind of show, watching this video, uh, whether that's you're finding me on YouTube or on my website. Here's all the ways you can stay in touch with me. If you are finding me on YouTube, I encourage you to hit subscribe. If you're finding me on my website, you can subscribe to my newsletter just to get a sense of what's kind of on the agenda, latest content, things like that. And lastly, I encourage you to continue nurturing your mind, body, and soul, whatever that looks like for you. Alrighty guys, have a good one. Bye.